Greetings, respected viewers. Here I am outside the Azerbaijani Embassy in London. You can see the flag up above me. So um, the flag was the flag of the Azerbaijani Democratic Republic, proclaimed on the 28th of May, uh, 1918. And actually, that was the same day that the Republic of Ar Armenia was proclaimed. Um, so uh, why do they have the colors in that order? Blue at the top, that was of the sky, but that was the representation of God in pre-Islamic Turkic religions. Then they got the red in the middle for blood, I believe, the green for Islam. People say notably that's the bottom because over 90% of Azerbaijanis are Muslims. Usually they're very secular and in, and in practice about as Muslim as I am, um, Ramadan would be a time to cut down on the vodka. And they've got this seven pointed star in the middle, the crescent moon, which you see in most Islamic countries. So um, unfortunately their embassy is not in great shape. Look here, the national emblem with the, with the flame in the middle, um, uh, the land of fire in ancient Persian is what it means because there was so much oil or naphtha and it was leaking through the soil, would spontaneously burn. And you can see someone like that uh, uh, just outside Baku, which I've been to, Republic of Azerbaijan, but it's in very poor shape. Look, they're, they're, the color is gone, completely faded. They used to be colored in. You can't see the national colors here. A, putting a dot over a capital I. In English, a capital I does not have a dot. So it shows a lack of attention to detail um, of the Azerbaijani embassy. But I want to speak a little bit about the um, Nagorno-Karabakh dispute. So Nagorno-Karabakh, its name indicates really how this region has changed hands a lot. Nagorno, which is on the mountain or mountainous in Russian, Kara, meaning black in uh, Turkic languages, and Bach, meaning garden in Persian. So mountain black garden. Um, anyway, so the Azerbaijanis have been in the current Azerbaijani homeland for many centuries. And um, two thirds of historic Azerbaijan is in, is, is in Iran. Um, uh, so they often call that southern Azerbaijan, which is part of Iran. Easily a quarter of the Iranian population are the Azerbaijani ethnicity. Um, and then the Armenians have lived in the region for thousands of years as well. Um, the first officially Christian country in, in the world. Um, but they've got their autocephalous church. That's to say it's got its own head. It's an independent one. Um, it's not Catholic, it's not Protestant, it's not exactly Orthodox either. Um, but uh, I won't talk, give you a blow-by-blow -blow account of all the, all the disputes between them. But like, like every country, Armenia has waxed and waned as so has Azerbaijan. There was a stage when the Armenian Empire stretched from the Black Sea to the Mediterranean. Azerbaijan has been much bigger than it currently is sometimes, and these countries have sudden, sometimes fallen under the sway of mightier empires. Um, but anyway, fast forward to 1918, the Russian Revolution, the Russian Empire breaking up, Azerbaijan and, um, uh, and uh, Armenia both become independent. Baku being the capital of Azerbaijan, because that's what oil was found in the 1860s, prior to that being quite unimportant. But um, anyway, uh, there was a large Armenian minority in Baku, but fighting broke out and a large number of um, Azerbaijani civilians were killed by Armenian soldiers. I mean, at least hundreds of civilians. Um, th that was that. Remember, the, uh, the Armenian genocide be going on to shortly before that. In the Ottoman Empire, there was a large Armenian minority in Eastern Anatolia, and at least hundreds of thousands of them were killed by the Ottoman government, some deliberately, some more negligently. And uh, the, the Azerbaijanis, they speak a language which is mutually intelligible with Turkish. If you go back to 1918, it would have been virtually identical because uh, Turkish has changed a little bit because they went through a language purification when it was purged of um, some Arabic and Persian loan words in the, in the 1930s. And uh, they're both written in the same script in 1918. So um, some of these Azerbaijanis had said, why on earth would you be part of the Russian Empire, which uh, discriminates against Muslims and we don't share their language, we've really got nothing in common with them. We could be independent, we could be part of the Ottoman Empire united with Turkey or something, but not part of Russia. Was the Armenian Senate to make common cause with Russia? Because for centuries they've been surrounded by Muslim countries, Turkey, Persia, Azerbaijan, Remember Georgia, a neighbor of Armenia, for a long time before it was part of the Russian Empire and part of the Persian Empire. So the Armenians are supporting the Russians because they desperately needed Russian help. You know, nothing's changed in that regard down to this very day. But um, anyway, Azerbaijan and um, Armenia were briefly independent. There was the Battle of Baku, August 1918 into September 1918. This bizarre episode when Baku was held by white Russians and red Russians and Bolsheviks and anti-Bolsheviks. The British army was there, the Indian army was there under General Dunster. It was all known as Dunster Force. There were Dashnak, as in um, um, 
uh, Armenian nationalists, and they held it against the Army of Islam. The Army of Islam was created for all um, Turkic Muslims. That's Turkish and similar Muslims. The idea of creating a massive Turkic state all the way from, um, from Istanbul right into the heart of Central Asia. All the other Turkic pe peoples like Turkmans, Uzbeks, Kazakhs, Kyrgyz people, Azerbaijanis, um, the, the, the Turkmen people of, let's say, what's now Syria or Iraq, the Azerbaijanis currently in Iran, whether Sunni or Shia, they're all the army of Islam. Remember, that about 80% of people in Azerbaijan are Sunni Muslim, sorry, Shia Muslims, and about 10% are Sunni Muslims. But anyway, Dunster Force, they, they briefly held the city against the Army of Islam, which was really Azerbaijani nationalists and the Ottoman army. The Azerbaijanis had held, held Genja as their capital temporarily. Um, so they held them off and they later managed to flee. Now, um, Stepan um, Shampanian was um, an Armenian uh, socialist revolutionary who'd been in Baku for some years. And um, there was this curious incident of the 26 commissars when he and the commissars and communist leaders were tricked on getting, on getting to a boat and sailing across to um, what's now Turkmenistan, um, where they were all executed. Their bodies were later recovered and they were interred with honor in a central square of, of um, Baku. Now, um, Haider Aliyev, the father of the current president of, of Azerbaijan, um, Ilham Aliyev, Haider Aliyev, he was born um, in 1923, if memory serves, a Communist Party apparatchik in the NKVD, that's the secret police, viciously persecuting and torturing anyone who spoke out against Stalinism, anyone who spoke about even peacefully and lawfully achieving real autonomy for Azerbaijan. Well, there's a speech he gave in the 1980s, which the Azerbaijani government would now found acutely embarrassing, in which he said, Stepan Champagne and this Armenian is not just an Armenian, he's a son of all the people of the Caucasus because he stood for socialism. Anyway, so um, in uh, 20th of April 1920, the Red Army entered Baku. Lenin had um, said that if the people, the non-Russian peoples of the Russian Empire, wish to go independent, that will be allowed. I prefer if they don't have a voluntary and honorable union, um, uh, live on an equitable basis, but if, if they wish to uh, go independent, their, their wishes shall be respected. Well, he very soon regretted that, and he invaded these independent states, um, really all of them, all of the former Soviet republics, and indeed Poland, although Poland uh, successfully won its freedom for a while in 1920. But uh, so they, they reoccupied um, Azerbaijan and they ruthlessly put down the Azerbaijani independence movement, likewise Armenia, Georgia, some um, Azerbaijanis fled abroad into Turkey, and indeed a leader of this Azerbaijani government in exile existed in Ankara, Turkey, right up until his death in the 1940s. The man who said of the Azerbaijani flag, the flag once raised shall never fall. But anyway, so there was a communist system in, in Azerbaijan, and uh, Islam was very much discouraged, not actually banned, but they, the state officially promoted atheism, and they seized many mosques or madrasas, you know, religious schools, and used them for secular purposes. So religious property was mainly laicized. Um, and um, uh, so the one thing I got to say good for the, for the communists is there were fairly good relations between Azerbaijanis and Armenians at the time. A great number of Russians moved into Baku. They'd often been there before. And so Baku had a bare Azerbaijani um, majority. Well, fast forward to the late 1980s, and Gorbachev was general secretary of the Communist Party of the Soviet Union, as in he was top dog. That was the top job in the Soviet Union, not president, not prime minister, anything like that, general secretary. And he said he was gonna free the political prisoners. People would no longer be sent to prison for expressing their views. The Soviet constitution had everything in it you would wish to find about freedom of expression, about freedom of association, and so forth, about genuine autonomy for the Union republics, as in for Georgia, for Kazakhstan, for Latvia, wherever. But he was gonna try and make this real. But anyway, the Azerbaijani Popular Front was founded, a nationalist organization, and they, uh, so they, they started campaigning for real autonomy and eventually independence. But then clashes broke out in the late 80s between Armenians and Azerbaijanis. A large Armenian minority in Azerbaijan, and such as Sumgayit, this town which is famous for the chemical industry, and some Armenians were, were killed. So it reopened old wounds from, from slaughters from 70 years ago that people were, were remembering again. Previously hadn't mattered very much. Um, so 1989, was, there was a wave of nationalist movement across the, the, the uh, Soviet Union, Latvia, Lithuania, and Estonia. They remembered the uh, Molotov-Ribbentrop uh, Pact when the Soviet and the German foreign minister had agreed to, uh, to divide up Eastern Europe. And um, so a human chain was formed through Latvia, Lithuania, and Estonia, people holding hands on the 23rd of August, 1989, the 50th anniversary of the Soviets giving the Nazis the green light 
to invade these countries. It, it, it um, gave lie to the myth that the Soviet Union was a principled anti-fascist force when it had actively collaborated and encouraged uh, German aggression in 1939. Um, so uh, what happened next, this obviously had an effect on, on, on Azerbaijan and there were many protest meetings. And then what was gonna happen to Nagorno-Karabakh? So um, in 1922, that's when the Soviet Union was actually founded. Um, uh, Stalin was general secretary. He didn't, it, it, remember Lenin died in 1924, but the Soviet government was, was really setting it up and regaining control of the Caucasus and Central Asia. So they first of all created the, created the Transcaucasian um, Soviet Socialist Republic, which is Georgia, Armenia, and Azerbaijan. But then they sorted out the borders. Now what Stalin did is he deliberately gave Azerbaijani majority areas to Georgia, for instance, and an Armenian majority area to Azerbaijan, as well as moving more borders, he moved people. Russians in, Azerbaijanis out, Georgians here, Armenians there, Tatars here, and so on, to try to make the breakup of the Soviet Union impossible so that Azerbaijan would have a large non-Azerbaijani mi minority and there'd be lots of Azerbaijanis outside the frontiers of Azerbaijan. Now, he didn't make the dissolution of the Soviet Union impossible, but he did make it very messy and indeed very bloody. So what was to happen with Nagorno-Karabakh? It was part of Azerbaijan, but it had very few Azerbaijanis there. Only about 10% ethnically Azerbaijani, around 80% ethnically Armenian, a few others like Kurds, Russians, and so forth. So um, both Armenia and Azerbaijan became independent in 1991, um, and uh, fighting broke out almost immediately. The Armenians rapidly seized it. And they were re remembering, of course, about 80 years before the genocide they'd suffered within the Ottoman Empire. And the Azerbaijanis remembered the, the genocide their people had suffered in 1918. It was a rather smaller scale. So there was a war between the two countries. And uh, obviously Turkey was supporting um, Azerbaijan, didn't actually declare war on Armenia. The, the Russian army was still in Armenia, call it Soviet, they'd really just call themselves Russian. Some Russians actually fought for the Azerbaijani side. They might have just been friends of, of Azerbaijanis, might have just lived there, just did it for money and so on. Um, uh, and that was that. And the Greeks even sent um, intelligence officers to help the Armenians because they say the Azerbaijanis are on the Turkish side, so we'll be on the Armenian side. The Greeks and the Armenians tend to get along very well as well, uh, too. I mean, two Christian countries in, in the region. Um, so uh, that was that. And um, Nagorno-Karabakh fell into, into um, Armenian hands. They conquered quite a bit more of Azerbaijan, almost a quarter of Azerbaijan at one stage. And um, uh, what's his name? Gulbuddin Hekmatyar, this, um, this uh, Mujahideen leader from Pakistan came over and was assisting um, the, the uh, Azerbaijanis, despite the fact he's a Sunni and they're Shia mostly, and he's viciously anti-Shia, but there we are, they accepted his help. Remember, some of these Azerbaijanis had been in the Soviet army, had been fighting against the Taliban only two years earlier not Taliban, sorry, the Mujahideen, now they got this guy on their side, often saying, yes, we're Muslims, we're progressive, reasonable Muslims, we're not extremists, and this guy was beyond extreme, but they accepted his help with alacrity. And um, so there were various presidents of, of um, Azerbaijan, there were three in three years. So 1993, there's a, a um, sorry, 1994, I think it was, there's a coup d'etat, and who comes to office, but um, uh, Haider Aliyev, who'd been, who'd been General Secretary of the Communist Party in, in, in Azerbaijan in the 70s. He'd been in the Politburo in the 80s. You can see him there with a prominent place at the, at the funeral of um, Brezhnev, of Yuri Andropov, and indeed of uh, Konstantin Cherenenka. Uh, and then he'd resigned in um, 1989, that January, of a Black January, the massacre of um, about 160 Azerbaijani civilians by the Soviet army. Now, he, he hadn't resigned over many more massacres that uh, the Soviet authorities had, 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 had carried out, such as the Zhiltoksan massacre in, in, in Kazakhstan a couple of years earlier in Almaty, but perhaps you see the way things were going. So he came back and then he, he seized power. So it was the it was sign of the old communists getting back in the saddle and Moscow found this more acceptable. You see the same thing that happened in, in, in Georgia with Zviad Gamsa Khurdia overthrown by Edvard Shevardnadze and so on. So these former nationalist dissidents who'd spent much of the 70s in prison had been, had been presidents briefly of these newly independent countries. But anyway, um, uh, Haidar Aliyev had a better relationship with Moscow, managed to organize a counterattack, push the Armenians back, and regain some of the land. There was a UN ceasefire, and that's that. It's a frozen conflict. So Nagorno-Karabakh is entirely in, in, in um, Armenian hands. They set up the Republic of Arsakh, which has got a version of the Armenian flag. There are virtually no Azerbaijanis left there, and they do occupy some area that Armenia doesn't even claim as theirs. The thing is, Armenia is so tiny, um, it, it's got no room for retreat, so their military strategy has to be entirely offensive-minded. 
needed. So that's that they can't afford to concede ground. So by controlling some, some territory, which they don't even claim is rightfully there, it's not just more, they say, well, you know, it gives us a margin of error in case we get pushed back because our back's against the wall. We've got nowhere to retreat to. So that's, it's a frozen conflict since, since 1994, when there was a, a ceasefire firing across the lines from some time. Now, obviously, the, the Russia sends sells arms to both sides. Occasionally, leaders meet, there are platitudes, but um, expressions of goodwill which lead to nothing. Obviously, the worst thing for Moscow would be an outbreak of peace in the region, in which case it wouldn't be able to sell weapons to both sides, can play them off against the other. So, you know, they um, have decent relations with other countries. Armenia has to suck up to Russia. It's got no natural resources. It's only got four neighbors. It's got no access to the sea. Um, and so many Armenians are working in Russia. Whereas um, uh, Azerbaijan's got a lot of oil and gas. They have a fairly good relationship with Iran, their cousins. But there's this sore point about how about Tabriz, the historic capital of Azerbaijan, deep inside Iran. And they can't be too cozy with Western countries. Otherwise, Russia won't like that. And so there's really no end in sight to this conflict. That's the Nagorno-Karabakh conflict. Legally, the land does belong to Azerbaijan, but as I say, even in 1991, when the fighting broke out, they were, they were only a small minority, almost none of them left. So, so many refugees fled to other parts of Azerbaijan, and I've seen the shanty towns they live in. And you sometimes see are etched on mountainsides saying, don't forget about Karabakh in, in, in Azerbaijan. So it's a great way to distract people from the country's real problems. And uh, Azerbaijan's got three times the population. Of, of Armenia rather more than three times the wealth. So by rights should win. It's only by Russian support that Armenia manages to cling on. Um, and they often talk about the Khojali massacre, and that's absolutely true that um, hundreds of um, 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 Azerbaijani civilians were massacred by the Armenian army. There were several fairly large scale massacres by the Armenian army at the time. It's true the Azerbaijani army also committed such war crimes. I don't think on quite such, such, the, such a scale. So what I'm trying to do is tell the plain truth without fear, without favor, without trying to make any, any side look good or bad, just tell it like it is. Um, and there we are. So you could say the numbers were inflated and the Azerbaijani uh, accusations towards the Ar Armenians. I think that's true, but the, the substance of it is correct. There were several large scale massacres. I'm not talking about killing, killing one or two people. I'm talking about killing scores or even hundreds. I'm not talking about one madman shooting civilians, but no, surrounding a whole village, taking the people, having hours to calm down. It's not a combat situation and deliberately killing men, women and children, knowing they're not a threat. They're not trying to run away. They're not trying to attack the soldiers guarding them, but, but it'd be willful murder when there was absolutely no military rationale for killing these people, just a wanton slaughter. And sometimes people are incensed because their own civilians have been killed deliberately, accidentally, or they remember how their grandparents were killed, things like that. It's, 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 it's vengeance. So there's an, Azerbai, sorry, there's an Armenian church in Baku. They turned it into a library, don't even say what it was. When I was there, I didn't even say Armenia out loud, just said, um, just said enemy land. So they, they um, won't participate in any sports with Armenia, things like that. And sometimes they've deliberately destroyed some Armenian heritage there. Uh, I can't think what else. So, um, you know, if you vote for, if you vote for Armenia in the Eurovision Song Contest, some people did, they'd be arrested. So it's, it's a useful stick with which to beat the opposition because the uh, Azerbaijani regime is this is a rather ludicrous cult of the personality. It's completely kleptocratic. The same people who ripped off and terrorized the masses in the name of communism now do it for capitalism and then they now do it for nationalism, trying to distract people from their real woes, from exploitation, and by saying, by waving the flag and talking about Nagorno-Karabakh, and of course, Ilham Aliyev has done nothing about it, hasn't regained one centimeter of land in all his time. And he never put himself in harm's way. He was living up at Mgumu, the top university in Moscow, um, whilst other, other people were in the army. Um, so whilst those people were actually getting killed for it. So there we are. It's a very um, pointive, uh, poignant and plaintive tale, the Nagorno-Karabakh dispute, with really no end in sight. And it, obviously it suits some people that this intractable conflict should stay that way.